My name is Hugh Pike, and I am the CEO of the 3rd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, 3 Para. On the 2nd of April, a Friday, and indeed we were to learn that most things happened on a Friday all through the Falklands campaign, we were both the Army's Spearhead Battalion and the Lead Parachute Battalion, and warned to embark on the Canberra, uh, we finally sailed on her uh, for the South Atlantic on the following Friday, Good Friday. My battalion was pretty well prepared, I believed, in all respects, uh, to meet whatever lay ahead. And of course, what didn't lie ahead was at this stage very uncertain. But I was fairly sure, and I passed this on to my soldiers the first time I spoke to them, before we even left Tidworth, I was fairly sure that we were likely to have some sort of a war and some sort of a battle on our hands before the summer was out. And therefore, uh, despite the fact that we were uh, generally pretty well prepared for what lay ahead, the period of training and briefing uh, and preparation on the Canberra was an extremely important one and a very useful one. Uh, we obviously concentrated on maintaining a standard of fitness and I may say in some instances even improving our standard of fitness and the Canberra unlike many ships of the Royal Navy uh, gave us the opportunity to, to do this and perhaps one of the first lessons one points to is the need for a high standard of physical readiness in terms of phys physical fitness because very often this chance in terms of either time or resources the chance to get fit on a ship will simply not be there. Uh, apart from uh, physical training every day, we uh, concentrated on polishing up our weapon skills uh, and other predictable matters such as deciding exactly what scales of ammunition, clothing and equipment each soldier should carry dependent on his job in the battalion, uh, and studying the level of enemy forces, their capabilities, their morale, their organization, and studying, of course, the maps of the terrain that we were likely to have to cross. Uh, in addition to that, when we arrived at Ascension Island, we had um, uh, nearly two weeks lying at anchor there uh, during the period of diplomatic negotiations and during the period of the build-up of the task force shipping. And during that time, we were able to get ashore uh, and carry out some very useful live firing and indeed practice a helicopter assault operation onto Wide Awake Airfield. We also um, polished up our skills in, in disembarking from the Canberra into the landing craft which we expected that we would have to go ashore in uh, when D-Day came. We then sailed south and uh, on the 19th of May, two days before D-Day, uh, rather to my surprise, but I believe very sensibly, uh, we were cross-decked from the Canberra to HMS Intrepid, an assault ship. And this perhaps brings out another immediate lesson, and that is that if you think surprising things happen on exercises, you would be even more astonished at what surprising things happen in war, because you never really know from one day to the next how the plan is going to change, what the enemy are going to do, and how unpredictable events can be. We uh, were very, very cramped. Uh, on HMS Intrepid, and I think it's true to say that not even a section commander during that 48 hours before D-Day really could be sure of where all his soldiers were at any one moment. And it was a very disconcerting to be so cramped um, just before we, had, we were due to carry out the landing. However, we had carried out all our briefing and preparation uh, on the Canberra, and so when we cross-decked, every soldier knew exactly uh, what he had to do, what his part in the plan was, and he had with him, of course, all the equipment to do it. On D-Day, our task was to land at uh, Green One Beach, Sand Bay, near Port San Carlos settlement, and to move into that settlement and to secure it. Uh, this we, we did successfully. Shortly after first light, the landings should have been all in the dark, but again, for reasons beyond everybody's control, the first phase of the landings took longer than expected, and many things do take longer in war than expected. 
and so it was daylight by the time we got ashore and the relief of getting ashore uh, from Intrepid on a beautiful early morning with uh, geese on the hillside and duck flying over the water a lot of bird life uh, on this very peaceful beautiful morning the relief of doing that was uh, severely interrupted by some unpleasant realities which hit us very quickly one was the shooting down of two uh, gazelle light reconnaissance helicopters by small arms fire from a withdrawing party of enemy uh, withdrawing over the hills from Port San Carlos. Both the helicopters were completely destroyed and three of the four air crew were killed. And shortly thereafter, uh, the first Pucara uh, ground attack with machine gun and rockets uh, took place amongst the houses of the settlement. Thereafter, we carried out what you might describe best as routine and defence for about the next six days on the hills around Port San Carlos settlement. Uh, this was a period when the soldiers learnt very quickly to live in the field and expected to continue to live in the field for an indefinite period, something which of course does not happen on exercises. And I believe another lesson is that we do not spend long enough in the field on exercises. And it may sound absurd, but I think it was true to say that some of my very young soldiers were surprised when index was not declared after about five or six days. During this period, uh, we also did a great deal of patrolling um, out of the bridgehead, not least to keep people on their toes and to keep them busy. This patrolling was in pretty foul weather conditions and was very tiring. And it's an interesting point of battle procedure that when, uh, rather unexpectedly, we suddenly uh, got on the move on Thursday the 26th of, of May, uh, many of my soldiers were very tired because they had been patrolling and I had expected that we would stay in that bridgehead for a further few days. A lesson in husbanding one's resources, perhaps. We uh, set out on the 26th on a much more direct route to our next objective, which was Teal Inlet Settlement, um, than Brigade had originally recommended to us. And here, perhaps, is a point uh, concerning local knowledge. The brigade commander had tasked me to follow up behind 4-5 commando to Douglas Settlement, and then to pass through them and on to Teal Inlet. Uh, there appeared to be no particularly strong reason for doing this. It was a very significant dog's leg, and it seemed to me much more sensible if we advanced towards Teal Inlet concurrently with 4-5 commando heading for, uh, for Douglas Settlement. And having spoken to the uh, manager of the settlement at Port San Carlos, he confirmed that there was a much better direct route which we could take. And after consultation with the brigade commander, that is what we did. Uh, after about a 24-hour march, mostly by night, and the night in the Falkland Islands at this time of year was about 14 hours, and obviously we were anxious to do as much of our moving as possible at night, um, after the first 24 hours, we had broken the back of this very arduous journey across country to Teal Inlet. Uh, we had wisely, uh, I believe, decided that we would only take with us uh, the, our immediate needs, uh, that is to say, um, ammunition, the essential ammunition scales, uh, hardly a, a, even a 24-hour ration pack, uh, a few items from one Arctic ration pack only, a change of socks, and otherwise just our battle order, what we needed to fight in, in other words. And it was only by going light that we were able to negotiate by night this extraordinarily difficult terrain. Um, terrain of high rock, uh, deep bog, and no tracks of any sort whatsoever. Navigation was very important um, because, apart from anything else, navigational errors used up more physical uh, strength and soldiers became even more tired. And Navigation was difficult. It was a dead matter of dead reckoning and, uh, for example, of using the fence lines, which are very accurately marked on the map, to uh, assess how far we had advanced. Uh, on the second night uh, of uh, our advance, after having lain up uh, in order to, uh, uh, to avoid possible air attack uh, in the Aroy Pedro River, a few kilometres short of Teal Inlet, on the second night we moved in 
um, cutting off any possible retreating enemy on the far side of the settlement and without difficulty secured uh, Teal Inlet settlement. Um, thereafter, very quickly, I had further instructions from the brigade commander that he, w he wanted me to continue the advance. And I was uh, equally keen to do this. But I did have to take account, and indeed I was quite concerned by the fatigue of my soldiers at this stage and their inability to have any chance to change their socks, let alone dry out and have a bit of a rest. Particularly since um, the warning order for Estancia House, which was our next objective, stated that there was thought to be a force of about 200 enemy in that area. And again, this goes back to the, the, one of the cardinal principles of infantry operations, that uh, uh, progress must take account of the ability of subunits to fight a battle, should that be necessary, uh, when they get to the far end. But we pressed on, and it was significant that during our advance to uh, Teal Inlet, we had heard two paras battle at Goose Green to our south as we advanced through that first night. And um, as we waited at Teal Inlet uh, to go on again on the Sunday night, uh, we had news of the large-scale surrenders at Goose Green. And there's no doubt that that buoyed everybody's morale and spirits quite uh, considerably. And a similar pattern then developed. We marched for all of one night, a very difficult advance around a lot of water inlets, where again, accurate navigation certainly paid off and proved to be very, very important. Uh, we then lay up during the hours of daylight, and on the second night uh, of this, this second phase of our advance, we moved in uh, the few remaining kilometers and secured uh, Estancia House and the high ground around it. The enemy had fled before us, and again, this objective was secured without difficulty. We then had um, quite a long wait from the 1st to the 10th of June. Uh, during this period, the 2nd Brigade, 5th Brigade, had landed, a divisional headquarters had arrived, and that this, to some extent, um, imposed a break on the advance of 3 Commando Brigade. Uh, but very early on in this 10-day period, I was aware that our next objective was going to be uh, Mount Longdon, which from the top of Mount Estancia obscured our view of the town of Stanley. We could also at this time see the airfield very clearly and the Hercules still landing on it, and most of the town of Stanley. Again, uh, I had to balance the importance of keeping soldiers on their toes and um, highly... Uh, charged, if you like, uh, to balance that requirement against the need to rest them up for the undoubted battle that lay ahead. And this, I think, is a balance which a commander must always uh, try to achieve. I used my patrol company extensively for reconnaissance around the area of Mount Longdon. And they were normally out for two or three nights at a time. Uh, it was an invaluable force to me, this, because I knew that I would not probably require them to take a leading part in the battle that lay ahead. And that enabled me largely to rest up my, the soldiers of my uh, rifle companies and indeed to give platoons on rotation a chance to get into a woolshed, to dry out a bit and sort themselves out and recover a bit from the very arduous advance which they had already completed. Uh, during this period, we did do a number of fighting patrols, however, uh, from all the rifle companies because my company commanders were concerned that the soldiers would get rather bored and they needed something just to keep them on their toes. Uh, I tried to achieve what I might call a reconnaissance in force. I did not want severe battles with the enemy as a result of these fighting patrols. There was no need for them. We had sufficient information from our recce patrols, but there was this need to keep the aggressive spirit going during this waiting period. And I think we achieved that quite successfully. And then on the 10th of, uh, of June, uh, I received my orders for the, um, for the attack on Mount Longdon. I had already a very clear idea of what those orders were going to be, and therefore I was able immediately that evening to issue my own orders um, for the battalion attack. And that gave my company commanders and rifle companies the whole of the following day, that is the 11th of June, uh, the whole of that time for their battle procedure and 
uh, the use of models and all the traditional briefing aids to get their, all their soldiers ready for the night attack of the 11th, 12th of June. Uh, an attack which we appreciated was uh, perhaps the most important thing the battalion had to do, uh, for, had had to do for, for very many years. The brigade attack, uh, this brigade attack by three commando brigade, uh, was aimed to take the high ground of Mount Longdon, um, Two Sisters, and Mount Harriet. And thus, three commando brigade aimed to close with the enemy's main defensive positions and to gain such a firm foothold on them that the enemy's position would thereafter be a hopeless one. And this is what was achieved by that brigade night attack. It was to be a silent attack uh, because the uh, distance over which we had to advance was very considerable. Uh, in our case, it was about a three-hour advance. And it was interesting that during the uh, period of intensive patrolling that, that preceded it, uh, very few of our patrols were compromised in any way, and it seemed still on the, uh, the 11th of June that the enemy did not have a clear idea of our intentions. This, interestingly, I believe was partly due to their own lack of understanding of the principles of defence, particularly the principle of defending well forward and patrolling really aggressively from their main defensive positions. And this played into our, our hands and enabled us to close right up with those positions with impunity. One of my concerns was the very open nature of the ground around Mount Longdon. And further to that, the lack of any detailed intelligence about the enemy positions beyond Mount Longdon, uh, between the mountain and Stanley, that is, particularly in the, way, the area of Wireless Ridge. Uh, this meant that we could not realistically, even by night, and the nights were generally uh, fairly bright with good visibility, uh, we could not realistically hope to either outflank the position, uh, let alone to ignore it. And therefore, really, the only sensible plan, uh, taking into account the enemy minefields which we knew were immediately to the south of Mount Longdon, uh, that the only plan could be a very simple one whereby we fought our way from west to east steadily along this mountain. That in itself uh, put a heavy premium on artillery fire and certainly one of the great lessons uh, of all these attacks was the importance to the infantry of very very close and intimate artillery support and I'm convinced the closest rounds that uh, landed to us during our battle for the mountain uh, were our own from our 105 millimeter guns and from the frigates. The execution of this battle, uh, the description of how it went, um, I shall leave to one of my company commanders and one of my platoon commanders to describe to you in more detail. But there are certain points that I wish to emphasize now which I think are important. The first, I've already mentioned, the essential uh, nature of very, very intimate um, artillery fire support. We had an FOO with each company, and one of those was a naval gun fire support officer as well, and he controlled the guns of the frigate. The silent nature of our, of our advance uh, did mean that in gaining our initial foothold on the mountain itself, uh, we did not, I believe, with hindsight, make as much use of artillery fire as we could and should have done. Uh, whilst we were fighting for the area known as Fly Half, uh, that is to say the western end of Mount Longdon, our artillery was mainly concerned with neutralizing the enemy positions further to the east around full back and in the saddle between these two, uh, these two peaks of fly half and full back. It would have been possible, and I believe would have been to our advantage, if uh, we had engaged for perhaps as much as five minutes, engaged with artillery fire, uh, the area of fly half immediately before my uh, rifle platoons closed with that objective. 
and one would have seen them perhaps crouching in the rocks at the foot of the mountain with artillery fire coming down just a few metres to their front. And thus, I believe they would have been enabled to get onto that position with less casualties. As it was, by the time uh, B Company, my B Company, had got onto that uh, first part of the position, they had already sustained um, quite a number of casualties, although the company was still completely viable and fighting on uh, thoroughly efficiently. The second important point, uh, I think, is that command and control uh, of uh, an action such as this, uh, which is in the dark, of course, uh, is very, very difficult, particularly over ground which is broken, uh, rocky, and where even a group of, of three or four soldiers uh, cannot easily see what each other are doing at any given moment. And therefore, there is an enormous premium placed on the initiative, the training, and the discipline, and of course the bravery of soldiers at the lowest level. And I believe that in peacetime, we uh, compromise on the selection of soldiers and non-commissioned officers in terms of their quality at our peril. Certainly in this battle, as you will hear shortly, the um, demands placed on small groups uh, working uh, as teams, friends who probably knew each other very well and who trusted each other and who'd worked together many times on exercises. Um, the importance uh, of their ability to get forward and to deal thoroughly and systematically with the objectives which they faced was crucial in uh, the securing of this objective. And the third point is, of course, firepower. We only had one uh, machine gun in each section, and certainly we could have done with two. We used the 66 millimeter uh, as bunker busters to uh, very great effect, uh, whereas we found that the Carl Gustav was rather heavy and cumbersome and tended to migrate towards company headquarters uh, because the soldiers carrying it in a, a rifle platoon just could not fight and survive with it. Um, the importance of automatic fire, both within the section, uh, within the company, and of course from uh, the, machine, the SF machine guns and indeed Milan, was again a most important factor in the winning of this battle. We did not have with us any uh, CVRT, either Scorpion or Scimitar, and they would, I think, have found this particular uh, objective a very awkward one. But uh, the message is that Far par is what wins battles. Far par is the great persuader, and the more you can uh, you can acquire for an operation of this sort, the more likely you are uh, to be successful. I shall make some further uh, observations uh, at the end of this account, but in the meantime, uh, we're now going to hear from uh, one of my company commanders, David Collett and from one of my platoon commanders, Mark Cox, about their parts in this battle. My name is Lieutenant Mark Cox. Um, I command 5 platoon in B Company and commanded it for the Battle of Long Mount Longdon. I'm going to talk about the fighting through actually on the feature itself, and then I'll be followed by Major Collard from A Company. I'll start at the point where we were on the start line, um, just before the battle commenced. B Company were the first company to attack the hill. And we had four platoon left. My platoon was central. And six platoon were on the right. We'd all been given our various areas of responsibility on the feature by Sant Pettinger pointed them out and who'd been on a patrol to the area himself a few nights before. So personally, I was able to see the precise area that my platoon were going to march towards. The men had put themselves in extended line and we were waiting the word to go. The moon was behind the mountain and you could see the outline of the hill silhouetted against the sky. When the word came to go, we relayed it to the sections 
who then started off. And on the open grassy area that moved up towards the craggy rocky mountain itself, it was very easy to control the movement of the sections as we got up to the hill. I had one section right and two section left with three section in the rear and I was between my front two sections. Once we reached the hill, I had that strange feeling that we'd had at Teal Inlet and at Estancia of getting ourselves into a formation, preparing for an action and nothing was going to happen because we'd marched all the way to the first rocks of Fly Half and no enemy had either seen or heard us and there'd been no reaction to our advance. Once we hit the rocks, we moved amongst them, but the terrain split the sections up. Some soldiers followed um, in single file their section commander. Others moved around rocks and regrouped on the other side. There was a rock ridge which cut the platoon in half for a short period. And one of my first um, feelings as we got to the rocks was Crikey, how am I going to keep control of the three sections totally dispersed by the, the rocks here? Um, observation was my first thought, and I, I moved around quite a lot, talking to the section commanders on my radio. And we maintained the advance along the northern edge of Mount Longdon. As we were going along this edge, um, four platoon who had been further to the north and the lower slopes of the northern half of the mountain came up to a minefield and Corporal Milne stepped on a mine and the explosion obviously alerted the enemy for very shortly after that um, there was a lot of machine gun firing from high up on the top of fly half and the full back feature of the mountain at this point, there was not an awful lot of fire coming down on my platoon, and it was very easy just to look up and see the tracer moving over the northern area of the hill. And our first concern was to see if we could do something about the, the gunfire up at the top of the hill. We kept the advance going, and my first casualty occurred very shortly after that. Um, Private Heinmarsh was hit, and he, was, he had a flesh wound in the bottom, but we, um, we looked after him and continued the advance along the bottom, and, and in the knowledge that some of the firing that we could hear was now actually being directed at us. We had been seen. Um, moving amongst the rocks. One of the, uh, the other fa fa features of the environment that uh, I can't forget was um, the fact that that part of the hill in, in the rocky shelter at the bottom there, the Argentinians obviously decided to use it as a latrine. And many of the soldiers taking cover behind the rock were absolutely covered. And uh, however, um, we, we started to retaliate to some positions that we could now see, um, which gave themselves away by the blue muzzle flashes um, in the rocks. And the section commanders were grouping their sections as best they could, given the terrain, and using their 66s and the GPMGs were directing fire back at these positions. There wasn't too much resistance from these first positions, and we cleared through um, fairly rapidly along the northern side of the fly half feature. Using the 84 millimeters, we had come unstuck uh, a little bit. The weapon had misfired, and um, I remember seeing a weapon lying by a rock and going to pick it up and get one of the rounds that was lying there 
into action against a position that we'd just come across. And being told by the operator, don't touch that, sir. It's, uh, it's just not worth it. Um, they'd tried with those rounds to um, deploy the weapon, but uh, it hadn't worked, which was quite frustrating, because in practice, you see how heat round um, demolishes its target. It, was, it would have been very useful to have had that firepower more convenient to deploy. However, the 66 millimeter did work very well, and lots were used against positions on that northern side. In one particular case, um, Lance Corporal Carver and some privates with him took out a .5 caliber machine gun um, that they had come across, um, which was further up the hill than they were. And they could see the barrel against the sky. And it wasn't actually firing that point, but um, he organized um, them. And they threw grenades. And uh, throwing the grenades up the hill towards this uh, weapon, they overthrew them so that the grenades would land on the other side of the weapon and therefore not risk uh, coming down onto them. And um, at the detonation, charged the position and captured the machine gun, one prisoner who spoke English, and uh, killed two others, um, which was typical, basically, of uh, many of the uh, other acts of um, taking out enemy positions, which had been quite well prepared with um, Sanger-type erections of rock walls and peat, um, digging into the peat as far as you as the Argentinians could. After all, they'd had two months to prepare the positions on the mountain, which, um, on seeing them the next morning, did appear to be um, impregnable. And uh, it was one of the surprises of the morning to see what we'd actually come up against. As we moved along the northern side of the uh, feature, we um, came into contact with four platoon who joined us from the left. and. I remember talking to Lieutenant Bickerdyke and uh, deciding how we were going to um, deploy what control we had of the um, various platoons, the various sections, which had come in to the rocks for cover from some of the fire that was being directed upon them by um, an enemy who I suspect were um, waiting for an attack from the northern side. Um, and the minefield was, if not properly covered by fire, there, there was some fire going down upon them. And by the time I met up with Lieutenant Bickerdyke, they had indeed taken some more gunshot wound casualties um, who were taken into the rocks with them. We looked up at the hill and assessed what we could best do. And Lieutenant Bickerdyke moved on to get a better view of things as I was moving back to um, my sections and was unfortunately hit in the left leg, in the thigh, and just rolled back into cover again. And um, he was so close to me that uh, I, I patched him up there. Um, while everyone else was getting on with the job, literally. Um, it was an ongoing situation at all, all times. The, the enemy positions would become visible either by fire or by, um, by fire being visible or by uh, the sound of gunfire coming from the positions or by being discovered um, in the move forwards. Um, and Corporal McLaughlin, one of my section commanders who was unfortunately killed the next morning in the artillery bombardment, um, was a, a very, very effective uh, section commander who managed to keep his section together um, most of the, for most of that advance. I took two of his soldiers and went up the hill, um, climbed up the side of the northern feature to try and get to a high point to see if I could pinpoint enemy positions that were on the side of the hill. And we climbed up. I climbed up with two of his soldiers and did, in fact, see some blue muzzle firing. And uh, we contacted some of the sections and told them of its existence. 
and uh, we were surprised, in fact, by some shots immediately behind us, perched up on the rocks as we were. And uh, remember, Private Grinham spun around and put a few shots into it, and it was silent again. And there, there was an Argentinian tent, and. Uh, a small position that was protected by rocks that we hadn't actually seen as we moved up. So four, by this time, four platoon and five platoon were basically on a front fighting along the northern edge of Mount Longdon. Six platoon had advanced up the top of Fly Half, the very summit, and even a little onto the southern edges, where they'd come across perhaps the majority of the Argentinian resistance on that that feature, and had suffered many casualties in the process. And every time they exposed themselves, someone else had, was becoming a casualty. It was very difficult to locate exactly where, in all the rocks, the enemy were, in fact, hiding and looking at you. And one of the, the big problems, in fact, afterwards, some of my soldiers told me that it did resemble, um, it would have been better perhaps had we approached the, the problem of the rocks and things, more like a house clearing operation um, than uh, an extended line fight through that we would practiced several times. The company commander, um, after a period of uh, a lull, decided that uh, it was time to use some artillery and we were all brought down from our positions um, at the end of the fly half feature and uh, taken into a safe place. The wounded were casivacked away from the battle area. And in the process of actually taking those wounded guys out, um, other people got um, themselves hit, taking care of the, the prisoners, uh, sorry, the casualties. Um, and at least one man died trying to help um, a friend. Lieutenant Bickerdyke had this, by this time been moved back uh, to the casualty area behind some safe rocks in preparation for moving them back to the RAP. And Sart Mackay took over his platoon. And Sart Mackay decided that he wanted to do a, a recce as well. I remember him um, and one of my section commanders um, talking behind a rock about moving forwards and looking for a particular machine gun that was uh, firing over to the north and I believe onto the wing forward area where A Company were at that time. And he and my section commander moved off um, in, in this area while well, I went and helped with my Corporal McLaughlin who was giving cover fire for that. And they managed to get some rocks. And we were t sort of put under fire from another position further up the hill. And while dealing with this, um, we managed to move forward quite some distance, various elements of four platoon and five platoon, moving up the hill in a pepper potting fashion, uh, which was almost instinctive to the soldiers. And we got to the, the top of the end of fly half from where there was very little cover in terms of rocky outcrops. And we were lying under a very shallow couple of feet of ridge and um, throwing grenades over the top and giving the occasional burst of GPMG fire. And Court McLaughlin had managed to get some of his section up there. There was some um, four platoon at the top as well. And uh, we got the word to draw back for artillery. So we came down the slope to discover that Sant Mackay had in fact died uh, in his attempt to take out this machine gun. And Corporal Bailey, who'd gone with him, had received gunshot wounds in three places. And the two privates who went with him, uh, James, had managed to get himself isolated out in front of us behind some rocks, whilst McLaren managed to get back to the, uh, the rest of the covering party with them. After the artillery bombardment, Major Argue decided that B 
the company, we're going to make another push forwards, and the rest of the company, excluding six platoon, who were still pinned down by sniper fire on top of the fly half feature, were organized by myself and my sergeant, Sergeant Ross, with the help of Sergeant Fuller, who'd come forward um, to help evacuate casualties and move the platoons forward, and who'd been um, a, a marvelous um, help uh, to, to organize the two platoons at that point. Um, the strength of the, the new attack was very, very much reduced um, as, re as compared to the company strength at the start of the battle. Um, it was more or less a strong platoon that uh, did the next part of the attack. And we moved forwards. And I decided to go um, on the north side and try to get forwards up the ground, up at the ground um, we'd been on before, before coming back, withdrawing to allow the gunfire, the ar artillery to have their go. We deployed in single file and moved down on the north side of the uh, end of fly half feature, stopped at the bottom of the rocks, and once the artillery had finished, we were given the word to go. We'd hardly gone 10 yards when um, I remember hearing the words, Il Hombre, and an Argentinian stepped out from the rocks and started firing his machine gun, um, a long burst of automatic fire, down the line of my men. And they unfortunately hit um, Private Crow, who died immediately, and um, another few people, including Lance Corporal Carver, who'd earlier taken out a 0.5 machine gun, and also Corporal Heaton, my two-section commander, in the leg, which he subsequently lost. Um, the immediate reaction was to get the blokes into cover, and as there wasn't any cover available at that particular point, most of the platoon went backwards, and um, we were so close that we had to take out the Argentinian using a grenade on, on the spot, which uh, we did. We subsequently found on moving forwards that he had two fellows with him um, who, after um, the grenade and 66 millimeter attack that we made, um, had died on that spot. Um, by this time, we'd got forwards to an area where we had been before. Um, uh, before the artillery um, bombardment. And as we were searching the dead people there, myself and one other soldier, um, we were opened up on again, and some of the platoon moving back into cover um, to get away from this dreadfully exposed rock face um, were hit again and pulling people back. Um, proved to be quite a, a costly uh, operation. However, um, we managed to get um, that position consolidated, if you like, but had to withdraw to the area where the company had uh, consolidated before the artillery. Um, and at that point, um, A Company took over the battle.